lightning bolt, a symbol of quick striking power, an emblem that perfectly defines the team that has borne its jagged edge, the San Diego Chargers. From the franchise's humble beginnings right through the present day, the Chargers' signature has always been the big play, the sudden strike, speed and guile over caution and brawn. San Diego has been the home of some of the greatest stars in pro football history. Their spectacular talents have inspired ovations and rewritten the record book. Charger coaches have been among the game's greatest innovators and strategists. Leaders who have changed the face of pro football. This is the story of the men who built the Chargers and made their lightning strike. The carefree decade of the 1950s was drawing to a close. The days of 3D glasses, Elvis the pelvis, double beds, and I like Ike were giving way to a new decade of fresh energy, with new frontiers waiting to be conquered. It was this atmosphere in 1959 that prompted eight men known as the Foolish Club to create the American Football League. For the sum of $25,000, hotel and credit card magnate Baron Hilton purchased a franchise for Los Angeles and appropriately named his team the Chargers. Hilton then selected former Rams coach Sid Gilman to build the team. At the first tryout camp, more than 200 aspiring players auditioned for the fledgling franchise. Unfortunately, many of these would-be gods of the gridiron were overweight, unemployed, and short of breath. Yet somehow, the coaches found enough quality athletes to stock the roster. And on August 6, 1960, the new Los Angeles Chargers raised the curtain in glorious fashion. Season. The Chargers leader was Jack Kemp, an NFL discard, who became an all-league quarterback with his scrambling style and accurate passes to receivers like Don Norton and Dave Kosurek, number 83. Kemp guided Los Angeles to a Western Division title, but few witnesses were at the Coliseum to verify the fact. With attendance problems threatening Hilton's team, a neighbor from the South came to the rescue. After various meetings between the mayor and Baron Hilton, in early 1961, the San Diego City Council, meeting an executive session in the council chambers, invited the Chargers to come to San Diego. Upon league approval, the Chargers staff packed its bags and headed south. Their new offices were in the Lafayette Motel, adjacent to an exotic dancers club. The team's new playing site, Balboa Stadium, was expanded to 34,000 seats. Finally, in the fall of 1961, San Diegans got their first glimpse of their new team and the AFL's first superstar. Who said lightning never strikes twice? Here's Lowe in high gear again. Yes, in high gear to another touchdown. Now you know what those lightning bolts stand for on the Charger helmets and pants. Paul Lowe was a street kid from the Watts ghetto who found success in the new league. His high-stepping gallop was an apropos style for this thoroughbred of AFL running backs. I had in my mind, I don't think a person could really catch me. Uh, 
I could get by a person I want, you know, if I was in shape and had to win, you know. And I just had a lot of confidence in what I was doing. I was a track man in high school and college, and I was a high hurdle champion. That is where I get my style from, with the high knee action from running track, you know. I wasn't no power runner. I was not run over anybody, because when I first started out, uh, but I weighed 172 pounds. See, and uh, I don't think I could run over anybody, not even the coach. Instead, Paul ran past the opposition, totaling the best yards per carry average in league history. Only one other AFL back rushed for more career yards than Lowe, who retired as the most prolific runner the Chargers have ever had. While Lowe set records on offense, the Chargers' defense set a standard that may never be equaled. In 1961, the defensive squad led by Charlie McNeil and Dick Harris intercepted a pro record 49 passes in a single season. Such larceny was possible thanks to a ferocious pass rush led by an off-season professional wrestler named Ernie Ladd and his associate Earl Faison. At their peak, the Earl and Giant Cat were part of the most dominant front four in the AFL. Despite such talent, the Chargers lost twice in championship games, then endured a losing season in 1962. Coach Gilman now felt the need to toughen the team's hide at a new training facility. But he took us to a place about 80 miles east of San Diego, up in the mountains. It was called, I mean, the actual name of it, it was called Rough Acres. Can you imagine a town called Rough Acres? It had about 11 people in it. It was hot as can be. You just couldn't imagine how hot it was. The food was awful. I mean, you couldn't get a self-respecting cook to go up there. And I think the guy who was our chef was a guy who was a short order cook at a little truck stop on the highway. Amid bad food and rampant rattlesnakes, the 1963 squad was built. The final touch was added when the Chargers won a coin flip and acquired the rights to Canadian League quarterback Tobin Rote. At the offensive controls, Rote guided the team to its best record ever, putting them in the AFL championship against the Boston Patriots. The day belonged to number 22, fullback Keith Lincoln, who accounted for a record 349 yards in total offense in the most lopsided championship game in league history. The thing that impressed me immediately was how easy it was because we didn't expect it to be that. Uh, we had played New England or Boston twice that season. I think the scores were something like 14-10, 10-7, that kind of thing. They had the good defense. So I was expecting a very, very tough football game, and we jumped out and scored three, four touchdowns. The momentum was our way, and we had trouble doing anything wrong the rest of the day. If such a thing as the perfect game exists, San Diego played it against Boston. Keith Lincoln's once-in-a-lifetime performance had, at long last, made the Chargers champions of the AFL. No club in the AFL's early years could equal the talent of the Chargers, who won five division titles in their first six seasons. They won not only games, but converts as well, to a new style of play unlike anything seen in the past. Sid Gilman was the architect of this bold approach to offensive football. He took the talented Chargers and armed them with vastly sophisticated strategies that reshaped the modern game. Weak safety man runs to Lance. And again, Lance, you run that hook and, and get that leveling off period and sit down, and then you skip off from there. Anytime it's when I first joined the Chargers, I felt that uh, uh, that our passing game was uh, really the ultimate. Uh, it was the epitome. We knew what we were doing. We felt that when our quarterback set the pass, uh, that he knew as much about where that ball was to go and uh, could direct it there. And uh, we were probably uh, as scientific as it was possible to be at that time. Gilman's on-field surrogate was now John Hadle, 
an ex-Kansas halfback who could, on occasion, call upon his collegiate running skills. But Hadel threw the ball even better, meshing perfectly with Gilman's passing philosophy. It was throw the ball and muster all the speed that we could, could possibly get. We didn't have much patience with slow, lumbering people, and the emphasis was on quickness. We wanted to put the fear of the good Lord in the defense's eyes. They had to cover our long ones. In San Diego, the long ones usually meant passes to one man, number 19, Lance Orworth, the most exciting performer the AFL ever produced. I'd have to say it was really a God-given talent. Uh, it's an eye-hand coordination thing, and uh, I think a desire of wanting the ball above everything else. When the ball was up there, I felt like it was mine. Take a drive corner, Lance, or, you know, coming in from a good wide position and starting right down that middle and then breaking it off and taking it to the corner. You'll lose him. You'll lose him. You'll lose him. The man nicknamed Bambi ran up some impressive numbers. Seven consecutive thousand-yard seasons, three pass-receiving titles, and countless defenders left choking in the dust. Lance Orworth was the point man of pro football's most sophisticated passing attack, an offense that bolted through the AFL to the delight of San Diego fans. But this sleek and sporty charger was now racing on an antiquated track. Balboa Stadium no longer met the city's needs. A new stadium was necessary. And through the efforts of men such as sports writer Jack Murphy, a bond issue for a new facility was voted upon in 1965. With a 73% yes vote, ground was soon broken, and San Diego Stadium came to life. A year later, Baron Hilton sold the team to Eugene V. Klein and other businessmen for a record $10 million. By 1967, new ownership and a new stadium were firmly in place, but it was still the same old explosive Chargers. First time he was 50, went cover seven. Second time he was 40, still went cover seven. I haven't seen any strong coverage yet. Behind an offensive line that included Walt Sweeney, Ernie Wright, and Sam Grunison, San Diego was running the ball with an all-rookie backfield that included an ex-Marine turned fullback named Brad Hubbard. Hubbard shared rushing chores with number 22, Dickie Post, a fireplug who churned his way to Rookie of the Year honors in 67 and a league rushing crown in 1969. The Charger teams of the late 60s did not earn any championships, but they never failed to post a winning record. In 10 AFL campaigns, San Diego had nine winning seasons, a distinction no other team could claim. Finally, on December 14, 1969, the AFL played its final game. A merger with the established NFL would dissolve the league, but not before the Chargers made a curtain call. San Diego crushed the Buffalo Bills 45 to 6, and Lance Allworth caught a pass in his 96th straight game breaking the record held by Green Bay receiving great Don Hudson. As Hudson greeted the future Hall of Famer to congratulate him, the Chargers waved goodbye to the American Football League. San Diego was now a full-fledged member of the NFL. The Chargers' first decade featured many stars. But there was also a supporting cast of characters and cut-ups who added their own special flavor to the team.
Some achieved success, others faded from memory. But all were part of an organization whose members had a genuine fondness for each other. We got to the practice field. It was a high school field. All the snow had been shoved off the field, and it was freezing and cold, and we were standing around with nothing to do. The coaches hadn't showed up. Finally, after about 15 minutes, John Hadle said, well, let's do something to stay warm. Let's play a game of touch football. Keith Lincoln said, yeah, let's play the offense against the defense. Ernie Ladd, who was our defensive tackle, was 6'9", 325. His eyes weighed about a pound each. He said, no, nah, let's play the blacks against the whites. Well, everybody started laughing. The black players were running over one side of the field, and the white players running to the other side of the field. Now, they didn't let me play, because I'm Jewish. I had to be the referee. But what that told me, really, about us, at a time when it wasn't that fashionable, that we had all come together from every different background you can imagine. And in theory, you're not supposed to get along, but we had become so comfortable with each other that we could laugh at such ridiculous notions as the artificial separation of peoples by races or religions. It's a very closely knit group, and I think there's uh, lessons to be learned in that for, on a broader scale than just football. Camaraderie kept the Chargers together as a team but it was individual talent that made them contenders throughout the 60s. On defense, there were several players who distinguished themselves. One of the best was a former Outland Trophy winner, defensive end Steve DeLong. For seven years, DeLong keyed the pass rush of the front four while linebacking was handled by such performers as Emil Karras, Chuck Allen, Frank Buncom, Bob Babich, and Rick Redmond. The secondary featured standouts Bob Howard, Chris Fletcher, and Kenny Graham, along with a 10-year mainstay at both safety and corner, number 40, Joe Beauchamp. most feared member of the San Diego secondary was Graham, number 33, a bone-jarring hitter who could also break games open with clutch interceptions. But of all the performers on defense, the single most exciting player was a man they called Speedy. Number 45, Leslie Duncan, was a coast-to-coast -coast threat every time he touched the ball. Duncan came to rookie camp with nine cents in his pocket and challenged all comers to a hundred-yard dash for a dime. Speedy never lost. Duncan could beat the opposition in a variety of ways. On Thanksgiving Day, 1967, his block kick rallied the Chargers to a come-from-behind victory over Denver. That same year, against the defending AFL champion Chiefs, Speedy picked off a Kansas City pass and returned it for a league record 100 yards. Duncan and other key performers kept the Chargers winning through the 60s. But as the 1970s began, the winning came to an end. Unhappy with the string of third place finishes, San Diego went out and acquired veteran players who had been proven performers in the past. The strategy did not work and the Chargers struggled. The early 70s represented the bleakest period in team history, as the club failed to post a winning record for eight straight years. But even in tough times, the Chargers still boasted excellent players. Tackle Russ Washington 
and guard Doug Wilkerson were offensive line leaders while the team was losing, and all pros when winning football returned. Washington retired after playing more seasons and more games than any other Charger, while Wilkerson stockpiled numerous postseason laurels and an equal number of backpedaling would-be tacklers. No runners benefited more from the blocking of Wilkerson and Washington than 1,000-yard runner Mike Garrett and a $100 bargain plucked off the waiver wire in 1974. Number 33, Don Woods, was an unheralded ex-college quarterback from New Mexico who went from a nobody to toast of the town in a matter of weeks. In a story right out of a Hollywood movie, the unknown Woods achieved stardom by rushing for more yards than any rookie in NFL history. Subsequent injuries kept him from equaling his rookie performance. But for a single season, Don Woods stood atop the football world. In stark contrast was receiver Gary Garrison, a model of consistency for 11 years. Opposing pass defenders nicknamed him the Ghosts for his uncanny ability to vanish without a trace. Garrison had been a local hero at San Diego State, then made a quick transition to the Chargers. Players and coaches came and went, but always there was Garrison, running playbook perfect pass routes for San Diego touchdowns. Unfortunately, the Chargers of the early 70s needed more players like Gary Garrison. To remedy the situation, team owner Gene Klein began to take an active part in acquiring talent. The first step in that direction was his hiring of a new coach, Tommy Prothro. Prothro's long suit lay in his ability to evaluate athletes. Among Prothro's passions in life were football and bridge. In his years with San Diego, Tommy used the collegiate draft as his trump card to rebuild the team. 1975 was San Diego's golden harvest. No less than eight eventual starters were selected, including offensive tackle Billy Shields and running back Ricky Young, number 34. Another astute pick was number 42, Mike Fuller, a standout on special teams and the defensive secondary. Joining Fuller on defense was cornerback Mike Williams, eventually one of San Diego's all-time leading interceptors. But the true strength of this draft came from three men who soon became part of the Chargers' power line. Louis Kelcher, Gary Big Hands Johnson, Mean Fred Dean. Just like that, the Chargers had a pass rush. Joined a year later by free agent Leroy Jones, the power line became one of the most feared fronts in football and a key element in San Diego's revival in the late 1970s. Chargers front office then successfully used the draft 
to build a defense behind the power line with players such as linebacker Woodrow Lowe. And by 1978, the basic foundation was in place. The defense had been constructed. Next would come the offense, an offense that was destined to become the most productive attack the NFL had ever seen. Throughout the 1970s, the Chargers struggled. Eight straight seasons without a winning record. But all that changed with the arrival of Don Coriel in 1978. I think the first thing that he brought to our team was a winning attitude. Uh, he'd been a winner throughout his entire career at San Diego State and also with the St. Louis Cardinals. And it's something that uh, we had the talent there, but we just didn't have the right attitude. Well, it's really looking for a great coach. Uh, and I truly believe Don Coriel is a great coach. Don Coriel has a very unique offense, an offense that is terribly, terribly sophisticated. Okay, we'll far right, 50, belly on blue, ready? Don throws the ball to everybody. And thus was born the most successful airline in NFL history. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Air Coriel and your pilot, Dan Fell, welcome to San Diego, home of the AFC Western Division Champion Chargers. Air Coriel became pro football's best way to fly. It established new trends and reshaped the thinking of offensive football throughout the NFL. This was no gimmick. For the San Diego Chargers, it was the most efficient way to become winners again. You have to do what you believe in and what you think you can do best. We go into every game with a, a, the, really the same thought in mind. If we can run the ball, if we think we can take the ball and run the ball, we're going to run the ball. If we don't think we can consistently move the ball on the ground, well, then we'll throw the ball. If we have to throw the ball every down because we know we can't run it, well, then we'll throw the ball every down. We like to control the ball through the air, taking the short passes, taking the big passes, um, get as many points as we can, as quick as we can because it gives you a chance to go back out again and get more points. Here was an offense that was heaven sent. Don Coriel revved it up. Everyone looked to the skies, and then came the command. Bombs away. Air Coriel was always fueled with great talent, starting with quarterback Dan Fouts. When you have a pure passer such as Dan Fouts, uh, it's like, from a receiving standpoint, it's like dying and going to heaven. Fouts' supporting cast included some of the game's greatest receivers, ageless marvel Charlie Joyner, game-breaking grabbers John Jefferson and Wes Chandler, all-Pro tight end, Kellen Winslow. So skilled were these athletes that sometimes even the perfect defense was not good enough. Fox to throw. Going long downfield for Chandler. Jump ball. Chandler has it. How did he get it? How did he get it? I don't know. This team can score at will. It can score when it has to, when it wants to, and it can. There is no end to the things that the San Diego offense can do. The Chargers rewrote passing records every time they threw. But most important of all was that the team began to win. Division crowns were soon followed by thrilling playoff comeback victories. Bounce to throw, fires the pass downfield, caught by Smith. He's at the point. When the Chargers drafted center Don Masick and acquired guard Ed White and super back Chuck Muncie, 
defenses were forced to respect the San Diego running game as well. While Muncie rumbled on the ground, Air Coriel shattered most of the NFL's long-standing passing records. San Diego featured the greatest offense in league history, and it participated in perhaps the greatest game ever played, a 1981 playoff duel against the Miami Dolphins. The day began with a first quarter explosion as San Diego jumped to a 24-0 lead. But by the third period, the Dolphins had struck back to tie. From here on, this epic struggle became an endurance test in the energy-sapping heat of the Orange Bowl. The game seesawed back and forth for over four hours. Playoff records tumbled in this marathon affair. The physical toll was telling. But through it all, the Chargers showed they were more than just a record-setting automaton. And when Rolf Bernerska's field goal won it in overtime, the football world realized there was backbone as well as glitter in the Charger lightning bolt. I don't view my role as being the quarterback of the most explosive offense in the history of the National Football League, but I do take a lot of pride in the fact that our offense has been very successful. And I know that when my career is over and I look back, uh, I will smile and say, yeah, that was a heck of a football team I played for. In 1984, the Chargers celebrated their 25th season in professional football. The year also marked the beginning of a new era in franchise history with a new team owner. After a career of remarkable success in construction, Alex G. Spanos fulfilled a lifelong ambition and purchased majority interest in the San Diego Chargers. It was more of an emotional purchase than anything else. I've always wanted to own my own ball club, and uh, hey, it's, uh, it's probably the worst investment I've ever made since I've been in business. But like I told my sons and I told my family, I says, I was 60 years old at the time. When you kids turn 60, you'll know why I did it. I could afford to do it. I've always wanted uh, a ball club, and damn it, I just went out and did it, and I've never been happier for it. I love the thrill and the challenge of being able to build a winner out of this ball club. Building is something Spanos had done all his life, and he knew he would need quality material to create a lasting product. Beginning on defense, Spanos signed number 99, Lee Williams, to go along with linebacking cornerstone, Billy Ray Smith, number 54. Also signed were eager young hitters, such as Jeffrey Dale and John Hendy, San Diego's secondary stars of the future. The action, Matheson pass intercepted. Intercepted on the far sideline, and he may go all the way on a return, 40-35. Long gone, 2015 touchdown, John Hendy. Spanos was also prepared to strengthen an already potent offense. Number 40, Gary Anderson, did not come cheaply. But soon, football fans everywhere realized that you get what you pay for. For Spanos and the Chargers, Anderson was worth every penny. Joining Anderson in the backfield was pro football's little big man, number 26, Lionel James. Draw play, Lionel James got a big hole. 50, 45, breaks to the secondary. 25, 20, may go all the way. 10, 5, touchdown. In 1985, only his second year, Little Train shattered the NFL's single-season record for all-purpose yardage, a giant feat from football's shortest player. Also setting records was the venerable receiving great Charlie Joyner. 
Joyner kept producing at an age when most players had long since retired. And in 1984 at Pittsburgh, Charlie Joyner assured himself of pro football immortality. Luther back to throw with all the time in the world, completes it to Joyner at the 50, and now Charlie Joyner is the all-time leading receiver in the history of the National Football League. And now the Chargers are coming out off the bench to greet Charlie, shake his hand. Raiders. First and 10, tied at 34 with the Los Angeles Raiders. They will sweep to the right side with Lionel James. 15, 10, 5, touchdown. The ball game is over. Clearly, the Alex Spanos era would bring excitement, thrills, and winning football to San Diego. The legend of the lightning bolt is a story that has barely begun. Now, well into their second quarter century, the Chargers have blended their traditional thrills with the aggressive ownership of Alex Panos as they seek new worlds to conquer. With an influx of great young talent, the Chargers of today and tomorrow will be as exciting and colorful as those who have gone before. The legendary Chargers, Paul Lowe, Kansas John, the intellectual assassin, and Speedy on the run. The giant cat, and Bambi. Steve DeLong, Dickie Post, Big Rue, and Walter Francis. Pete Lincoln, and the ghost. They are the proud past, and the prelude to a promising future. The San Diego Chargers. The legend lives on.